season five of The Score, the Team Roping Journal's podcast, where we cover the roping industry from top to bottom. This is where the team roping world talks. We talk through tough subjects, we talk big wins, and we talk real issues affecting the community. I'm your host and editor of the Team Roping Journal, Chelsea Schaefer. Hey everyone, this is Chelsea Schaefer and this is The Score. We are dropping this episode on October 6th, which is one month until the Riata Buckle Futurity. Uh, That Riata Buckle starts November 3rd and runs through the 6th at the Lazy E Arena in Guthrie, Oklahoma. And today's episode is with Mr. Riata Buckle, Denny Gentry, who is also, of course, Mr. USTRC, Mr. World Series of Team Roping, and now his latest venture is the Riata Buckle. So I want to tell you about this Futurity it is not a horse show. It is a time-only for charity. Uh, it is for horses that are in the uh, in the Riata Buckle incentive program by stallions that are enrolled in the Riata Buckle. It is stallion uh, owner focused as far as that goes, because the stallion owners buy their horses in uh, every year, and ropers then need to nominate their horses to compete. Uh, this year, there will be unnominated horses allowed on each side. Anyway, if this is all going way over your head, I get it. We're going to explain it all to you on this episode. Denny and I will talk through pretty much all of the details of the futurity, the questions that we have been getting asked. How much is it going to pay? Is it really going to pay $2 million? Well, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, How is that money going to be split up? We'll tell you um, based on every roping in this podcast to the best of our knowledge and and the way things are going to work out. So like I said, this episode is designed for ropers who maybe missed some of the details that we have dropped throughout the time that uh, we've been covering this since last December. And uh, I hope you enjoy this episode with the one and only Denny Gentry. Hey, Denny, welcome to The Score. We haven't had you on since we first announced the Riata Buckle. Um, so thank you for joining. A lot's changed. A lot's different now than when we talked six months ago. Right? I guess how have the last six months gone and how has the evolution been and the learning curve of this business? I, I'm really surprised. I learned a lot. I, you know, I, I thought I knew a lot about team roping, but I didn't know much about the breeding programs going on. And, and in fact, you know, some of the people that I've known for a long time, I had no clue how deep they were into the into the horse horse world, and and that's been an eye opener in the education process. But the funniest thing is, is that when we started six months ago, everything was so theoretical, and Lance and I are talking about what we'd like to see and what we'd like to do, and uh, and now six months later, um, my gosh, the program is developed. We've got the and we got the software together, we got the website together, we've got a plan, um, and we've got, you know, hundreds of ropers that have asked questions that obviously are considering it. I don't know if they'll show up or not. They've obviously got a lot of interest in what we're what we're trying to accomplish. And of course any time you you lay two million dollars on the table, well you're gonna get some interest. Mm -hmm. You said Lance, and we had Lance on the podcast last time. Give me the affiliations with Riata Buckle. How is it connected to Pink Buckle and Ruby Buckle and and everything else that's involved in the industry? Well, it's not connected to Pink and Ruby at all, except that Lance and Chad are both Pink and Ruby Buckle, and they are my partners in Riata. So, So there's an overlap, but those companies have no connection to each other. In fact, um, the office is set up in, in, uh, there in Spanish Fork are, are, uh, in different offices. Uh, Brooke and Trevor are in a different office in the Pink and Ruby staff, and we're running the roping operation out of Albuquerque. Okay. So, so it's, it's completely separate. And what's the affiliation then with the Equine Network and Global Handicaps? Well, we've got an agreement with Equine Network to use global handicaps, and we have have submitted a proposal to them to do a sponsorship with either World Series or U.S. or one of the roping companies, um, and it kind of as our feeders for for our uh, uh, Riata Buckle event. Now we haven't heard back yet, and I hope to be affiliated at some point 
through a sponsorship deal, but the assumption is out there that because I was formerly U.S. and World Series and, and um, that there is some connection there, which at this point there's not. I, you know, obviously, um, I'm buying advertisement and, and, and this is a, a happening event. That's your interest in it from Team Rope and Journal standpoint. Mm-hmm. But there is no connection at this time. Yeah, it's, I feel like uh, a lot of the calls that I've been getting, people sure think that it's just kind of part of what we do. And, and I have often said, no, no, it's just a, I think it's a huge, cool future event. Uh, you know, it's going to drive the future forward, in my opinion, as far as the roping industry goes. Um, but what are the questions that you've been getting most frequently? Well, I don't know how long you, how long your podcast is for, but... <laughs> Right now, most of the questions about nominations and the entries and, and you know, how they can pair their horses up and how they can get the most entries out of each horse and, and how to find partners and how to find horses that are under five that are not Riata horses and, and on and on and on. I mean, we're not talking about theoretical stuff now. We're talking about people that actually want to come and participate, and that's been the majority of them. But um, there's on on a daily basis there are, you know a, a half a dozen different um, discussion items that come up and and uh, from from running the rope and to what's happening in the industry to what's happening in the sales market to to uh, uh, you, you know who's out there doing why and, and finding horses you know I mean that is a big topic finding those horses yeah and I think. Have, do you get the sense that people have been finding those horses, that you're going to have a decent number of teams? Or what What kind of feedback do you have on that right I now? I have no clue. I, I know that I have. Uh, I was in Abilene two weeks ago, and I had probably uh, three different stallion owners come up and say that they're taking anywhere from five to ten calls a day on horses. Mm-hmm. And, of course, that's my answer to that is, well, that's what you signed up for. You want to create demand for the cold side of your stallion, which will create breedings, which, I mean, and, and they love it. But um, are they finding horses out there? I hear of people that are. I talked to a guy this morning that said, I bought 25 head of them. And I said, what are you doing that for? And he said, I've got three different riders riding them because people are looking and and uh, and he said we you know we saw what happened down at the four sixes sale last weekend and and now we're jacked up. So I said, you know, obviously there are a lot of things going to happen here that I did not know or anticipate. Mm-hmm. And we'll see where it goes over the next year or two. Well, tell me about the four sixes sale and how that has anything to do with what we're talking about today. Well, the four sixes um, uh, there's. There's that uh, return to the remuda sale they had last weekend was four of the old ranches. Four of those ranches had stallions in our program. Mm-hmm. And so they did a feature ad that went out all over the country that was some um, three dozen of those Riata horses. And so, and they were geared to a large degree because that's a ranching operation and a lot of those horses had had worked on the ranch and drug kids and they've got them in the arena and they're starting them and everything and they're three and four year olds that that would be a good place to find good young real horses and there were some reasonable horses bought through that sale there were a lot of them that went through there but there were a couple in particular that were the talk of the land on monday morning and that was uh, uh one one uh, buckskin colt that sold for fifty two thousand in her own mare there that sold for eighty seven thousand. Mm-hmm. And the idea, you know, that someone's gonna give that kind of money for a team roping prospect, um, it's just kind of blown everybody's mind and they're going, Uh oh, this reality thing is real. And that was the other thing, you know, six months ago they had the uh the Tayos had the sale there in Wickenburg, and we listed out all the Riata horses, and we put posters up and all things. Nobody knew what it was, so it was never even mentioned. Um, all of the four sixes horses had the incentives all listed down underneath every horse in the in the, uh, in the sale, and yet when they walked into the ring, the announcers are going, "Here's a Riata." Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't even put on the event yet, mm-hmm. and this thing has already taken on its own life. 
Can you, you said you're not sure exactly as far as team count's going to go. And that's what I've been getting. Like the people keep saying, do you think they're going to get any teams? And I feel like when we first talked, you had said like, you don't care if you pay this out, the 2 million out to 20 teams or 40 teams and get, you know, turn some heads. Do you have any indication yet though, if that's going to be the case or? No, no, I don't. And I get that question every day, and, and of course, it's been humorous now because we've done it enough now that we've got all the cute answers for them when they do that. You know, I had a guy from Montana call last week, and he said, uh, we had a nice conversation, and he was talking about his entries, and, and he got down to the end of the deal, and he said what you would think for a normal rope and was a normal response, and he said, well, I sure hope it's a good rope. <laughs> And and I kind of hesitated, and then I kind of chuckled, and I said, "Well, are you insinuating that I don't know how to put on a team rope?" Oh no, no, no! I don't. I'm not insinuating that at all. He said, "I'm just hoping we get enough teams to have a good rope." And I said, "Why would you want more teams if we got two? We're paying it." Yeah. And he said, "Oh my gosh!" He said, "I forgot about that." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's still the same answer, you know. Uh, it's the first time ever that I put on a rope and then I really didn't. Uh, you know, team counts had no consequence at all. I mean, it had no bearing. I'm, you know, I'm not laying awake and not worrying about whether anybody shows up or not. Yeah. Now, is is this $2 million rope in the end game? Or is there a larger plan here for you as far as what you want uh, this to look like next year, the year after, the year after? Is it just this one rope in kind of situation? Or uh, no, we're going to build. Obviously, we want to build it up and we want to build a major program here that's going to do what our original goals were to produce more rope and horses and to, uh, and to get that particular event up in the million dollar per division range as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. But um, in order to do that, you know, there are other programs out there right now. Of course, as far as I'm concerned, all the other fraternity programs in the business, the thing you can talk, and I'm not trying to compete with them or put their deal down at all. I'm just, everything else is basically set for professionals. Mm-hmm. With some intermediary stuff that, that turns out to be pretty high, high number combinations. We, we're the, the outlier. We're the one that's going to put together the ropers for the other 98% of the ropers out there. Mm-hmm. Well, in doing so, for ropers to want to climb in and participate in that, they're going to say to us, what else are you going to do for us? What are you going to do during the course of the year? How many more events are you going to put on and that type of thing? Mm-hmm. And and that is the the is where I'm I'm putting together a program right now where I don't have to put on the ropens, but we can utilize some of the major ropens in the United States to uh, uh, to drive this program, and it's going to just it's going to feed on each other. And I and I'm I haven't signed any papers yet on the deal, but we're very very close to closing a, a deal that will make this a year round program and and enhance the uh, the process for these people that are really trying to build the, the record for their stallions. Yeah, what have you heard from the stallion owners as of late? Have you been hearing? They love it. They're, you... they're loving it. And, and they've all got their own reason for being in the program, and that's what we're discovering. We're putting those stories up online as we go through each program. They, each stallion owner, we're writing a feature piece that we're putting up on the website that goes to Facebook, and we intend to put every single stallion owner in there at some point and let them have their say. But there's a kind of theme that we're running across that that uh, they all have, and, and a lot of them say, if you want to be in, have a legitimate breeding program and have demand for your stallion, you have got to to go and prove him. He's got to do something. Well, that's easy enough in racing, and that's easy enough now in barrel racing. But in team roping, no one has done this. So mm-hmm. How are we going to prove this out? Because basically all that's ever been there before has been AQHA, and we're able to say we had a junior hitting or a junior healing, and now from the pro level, you've got the the, uh, the two 
security programs mm-hmm. that you've talked about, and they can go in and say, we're the champion of that, and we won this, and we won that, and the money they won there is going to those stallion owners. Mm-hmm. Well, what I want to tap into is $30 million or $60 million worth of openings. Yeah. Where when an individual places at one of these major events, he may get the incentive money that we add on as added money there, but he can also go claim the winnings if, if we can verify their horses and we can put people in those places and run our program as an overlay on these huge events that are going on, then then we are in a position to say, okay, we're going to help you with your breeding program because you may be able to get $100,000 on your horse at one event. And that's huge because when you think of how they've had to do it, for the last 40, 50 years, mm-hmm. it's, it's completely different. Yeah, it's it's crazy. The the way that the other industries have worked versus the amount of money to be won in team roping, it's it's been right. the opposite. Like they have grown in yeah. opposite directions, which is, is very strange. They're fixing to be brought into the real world <laughs> real fast. As far as verifying horses, what are your plans to make sure that uh, there's not cheaters in team yeah. roping? It, once we get the program put together, that'll be a whole different thing. But but right now, in the short term, the questions we are asked are how to make sure that they're not switching papers on these unnominated horses or or that there's the little games that get played um, that have been played in AQHA and everything with these horses. AQHA has told us that they will do the DNA testing for us. Mm-hmm. And I don't even think that we have to worry about doing it on all the horses that that win a check, um, they're all coming to win. Mm-hmm. And I think as long as we do it on the top two teams or the top three teams in every division, uh, that should be enough of a detriment to keep those guys from trying to keep anyone. I'm not going to say guys, but mm-hmm. keep anyone from wanting to cheat the system for the money. I understand. Absolutely. Um, Tell me about the Open. What is that going to look like? Is it enter once, enter twice, up and back, twice on each end? Give me the... It's enter once. It's different than the others. And and Mm -hmm. it's obvious why, you know, I mean, we are in the, all the other Opens, we allow ropers to get in twice on either end, but but a horse can only get in the event one time on either end. Okay. And in the open, they are only allowed to get in up and back. They can only get in one time. Okay. And that's fairly obvious why, you know, because if we didn't, we would, if we had the same rules for the open, we would wind up where I was in 1991 when I was allowing two shootout spots for each, each, uh, um, uh, team. Mm-hmm. And um, and that worked real, real good until Jake and Clay won two holes and another team from the NFR won two <laughs> and four of the top ten holes were won by two teams. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that was the end of the two shootout deal for the open program at the US TRC. Yeah. And that's the same thing here. I'm not going to relearn the same lesson that I learned in 1991. And wasn't it in the same arena, ironically? Like you started the yeah. US TRC at the Lazy E. We were the first major event in at the Lazy E, and they pretty well acknowledged that that's what really put them on the on the map was the uh, the U- first U.S. Finals in 1990. And so I don't think that hasn't crossed my mind. That that's we're cool. Over again, right there. <laughs> yeah. At the Lazy E. That that did just occur to me. I was I was thinking about the the old pictures of those guys winning. Uh, Right. Yeah, that's wild. Um, and now as far as the open goes, you're going to have a little bit more score than the other stuff, right? Or a little bit more? Maybe, maybe not. Mm-hmm. I, okay. Um, I, you know, I I don't intend, I, you want to go back to that 1991 deal at that time and talk about what I learned. I believed in 1990 that the key to major opens, uh, major open opens were long scores. And we had that arena set up at 450 feet, and I scored those steers 25 feet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And 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 guess what? It was so new to them, they didn't even. Can you imagine today if, if we held the World Series roping and we scored everything 20 to 25 feet? <laughs> what would happen? Yep. 
no. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've heard from the open guys, they said, give us a good even cattle and give us a good fair start and, um, and, and let us, per, let the horses perform and let's don't gut them down the arena. Mm-hmm. So, yes, I want them to have to, I don't want to chunk and dunk, but by the same token, I'm not going to stress these, these, uh, these horses at all. Yeah, absolutely. That's certainly been something that people have talked about from other fraternities is is how hard they have to run on those hard running steers. And then you spend a couple months putting them back together after, after a big one. That's not going to happen. We're handpicking the cattle on this. And and that's the thing that, you know, we've had very few calls about the cattle because I think they know that how careful I was being at finale in Vegas over the years on trying to sort through those steers and making sure they're even and all that. Well, um, I'm using uh, uh, Matthews Land and Cattle Company up there, and I'm using them for a reason. Mm -hmm. Um, They have to provide under contract 600 head of steers each year to the finale in Vegas, which is one month after our event. And so regardless whether we stay in the November date or move it to some other place next year, um, I'm always going to have 600 head of steers to sort through mm-hmm. to get what we need. So I'm I'm hopeful that that uh, those guys have a thousand cows. I do not have to worry that at some point I'm not going to have decent cattle for this fan. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Well, that's good. I think, um, and they're those are obviously their steers that that they raise there, um, and they're. They've been quite reliable over the years. And, and they do have a few new herds of Corinthians, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, they wind up with some of them if they're broken and used good enough by them. Yeah, those guys are, are masters at that. Absolutely. Um, now, talk about, and that's a, a question that I get mostly from the open guys, I would say, is about the unnominated horses. Uh, how long, originally, I believe that you had said, the unnominated horses were going to be part of the program to help get this jump started because the Riata Buckle horses are are so hard to come by. Um, what's your plan for unnominated horses going forward? Well, Lance and Chad and I have discussed this, and I think it is about somewhere in the vicinity of three years out, we would do away with unnominated horses, mm-hmm. provided there are enough Riatas on them on the planet at that time that are available and, and the roping ability to have a decent showing. And I think that gives, if you're looking three years out and you're starting from scratch now, um, that puts a lot of horses in there by the fourth year. And I think we should be in good shape, mm-hmm. good shape by then. But the other aspect of it is right now is, is that you take the trees where are you going to get horses that are under that are five years and younger to offset these Riata horses and these fraternities? Well, that has to be from the other fraternity programs. Mm-hmm. It has to be from the AQHA, from their, from their, and that's where they're going to come from initially. And so the unnominated program was basically to utilize everything that exists in the roping world right now to, 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 prime the pump and get us going. I gotcha. I gotcha. Um, as far as the stallions, when do you think, when do you anticipate opening more spots? That's a question I get a lot. I, I don't know. Uh, again, that's more of a Chad and Lance issue. Mm-hmm. They, we had an agreement when I started that they would handle stallions and nominations and I would handle the roping aspect of it. Now, that doesn't mean I don't, I'm not, you know, on those discussions and everything, but originally we all agreed that we would only go to 150 pending some that absolutely had to be there for different reasons. And we're pretty close to that right now. Now, now my understanding is, is that, um, from their experience in Pink and Ruby, there are going to be a certain number of these young stallions that are going to fall out of there. Mm-hmm. That are going to say, this is just too expensive till we get enough colts on the ground and they will. So there, I'm not going to use the word waiting list, but there are a lot of stallions laying there on the table waiting to go in. Mm-hmm. And as those spots come open, I think that you'll see some of those stallions moving over. Um, but we haven't talked yet about adding more stallions in. And if we do, there'll, there'll probably be a, a, an announcement and, a, and, 
and basically here's how we're going to do it. Here's how many we're going to let go, and here's why, uh, kind of thing. But mm-hmm. but I would I would guess that that uh, that's a discussion that, that uh, will occur in the future. Okay, we are going to take a quick pause from this great conversation to talk about our sponsors at Cactus Ropes. Cactus Ropes released a brand new rope, the Huey OG, on October 1st. It's a collaboration, of course, with the iconic brand Huey. It's a team rope, and it's available in all head and heel lays. It's a unique feeling all white nylon rope with core technology and a medium diameter rope with sizable crowns, allowing for sharp dallies and plenty of body for great longevity and durability. There were a lot of wins with this rope during the testing process. Pretty much all of the cactus uh, endorses were using it undercover. You might not have known what rope they were using or what they had going on. Uh, But yes, it's a very unique rope, all white. You'll check it out at all of the big events coming up. It'll be at the trade shows. And of course, you can find more out about it at cactusropes.com or by calling 1-800-SPIN-WIN. That's 1-800-SPIN-WIN. Thank you, of course, to Cactus Ropes. They have been a longtime sponsor of the score. We are so grateful for Barry and Katie and crew over at Cactus Ropes for supporting this podcast uh, in for five years now. So thank you all. And uh, remember, cactusropes.com, 1-800-SPIN-WIN. Tell me about you're asking team ropers to to change their ways a little bit um, and enter through an app. Tell me about that decision and and what your hopes and and problems are with that. Well, of course, you know if, if you want to go do the basic form thing that you see a lot, you see forms online there and everything. Well, those aren't really operating within a computer system. What they do, they build the forms online. And you fill out all the information and it prints out a sheet on their desk and then they basically do the entries mm-hmm. the hard way, just like everybody else has always done, just like mail them in, except it's done via email. Well, with this particular rope and because of the complication of the handicaps and nominated, unnominated, the, the, um, there are eight to nine filters on this one rope, and if we were to do this on a form, we would have to build a form for each division. So if an individual entered five, six times, let's say up and back in three or four different ones, he'd have to send five pages of entries. <laughs> so an app was the only possible solution. Mm-hmm. Now, that's brand new, and, and it's going to look like Greek to those guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially, you know, the learning curve here is going to take a while. And it's going to continue because every time new people come in, they're going to see that app and they're going to go, wow. Now, right up until you asked that question a while ago about how long before the unnominated horses go out, when the unnominated horses go out, that's going to change the entry process a lot. Okay. That's a complication in the, in the mix right there. Mm-hmm. But with that said, you know, I know, I think everybody in the world knows that sooner or later, Equine Network is going to go to an electronic mm-hmm. uh, entry system. It, it's going to be pretty, pretty extensive. They're doing online entries right now for PPQ and some of the events, but that's different than a real, you know, a big program that's going to handle everything that way. Yeah. But, but it is going to happen. Now, our answer to that, um, I know the guys are going to be frustrated when we put a little speech up there on the website over it, but we've hired a full-time person that, that sits right there and that phone number is, is on the computer. And when they have any problem at all and they call, call the office here and say, I'm having a little trouble, here's the phone number. That lady will help you get everything in and make sure everything's working. So we're giving them person by person assistance. And it's that customer service thing that, that we've always talked about all these years. Mm-hmm. They don't have to 
have any frustration at all. We'll just put them, put someone there in the system and get in. Tell me about your team that's going to be there on the ground with you. Are you bringing like a lot of the same folks who we've trusted forever for the World Series in the USDRC? Or? The, best of the best of the best. And, and there's a reason for that. And it's not just for my own laziness or comfort. Um, I'm going to bring all those top secretaries in there and some of my best people for one reason and one reason only. This is different than a normal team roping. There are different issues that they're going to face that they've never faced before. And so we're going to look overstaffed over there the first time. And the reason's real simple. When this thing blows up in about three years, I don't want to have to be doing a, uh, a learning curve mm-hmm. for those people at that time. I just assume when we're small and we've got time for everyone to learn this right at the beginning stages. And then as things pick up, our people will be real well trained and will be able to handle anything that should come their way. And on top of that, AQHA is going to put a put a uh, business boot oh, right good. next to our entry office. So if there's any problems with nominations for any problems with registration, any of that, they have their computer set up right there. They will solve those horse issues on the spot. And and speaking of on the spot, are people going to be able to walk up and enter, or is this all something you have to do before you get there? Well, he, the books will close each day prior. I, everybody said, why are you doing... Um, uh, closing early entries in October and then take late entries because a lot of them are not going to have a problem. They can get all of those out of the way. Now, a lot of them are still going to be looking for partners mm-hmm. right up until the time, and I want them to be able to to uh, uh, to deal with that there the day before. Now, I'm not going to be doing anything on the day of an event, but the day prior, they've got all day long to come in there and get their business straightened out. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not sure we'll do that forever, but in my thinking, this is going to be a small event. I'm not talking about a, about a cluster in the office. Yeah. And there is a partner finder of some sort, right? We're, we're, we're trying that. We've got that up on Facebook and we'll uh-huh. let them tell us whether they've got a nominated or a nominated horse and what number roper they're looking for. And we're going to try to mix and match those people if we can and do our best to try to assist them. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's a big task. <laughs> Is, does it feel like a big task or? Well, not yet. Not yet. Not yet, but should be there. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Um, well, tell me, as far as I, I know, one thing I've thought about with Futurities and, and with everything that you do, like the production value and the show that goes on is important. Um, do you have any extras or anything like any of those intangibles that you can talk about as far as what's going to happen at the Riata Buckle? Well, we're going to start right from day one with the treating this like it is a major event, mm-hmm. and I'm going to treat it like a major event. Whether if it takes me only an hour to put on one division, that thing's going to be treated like it's the NFR. Mm-hmm. We're going to have this stuff streaming online, and and there will be the videos, and there will be the photographers, mm-hmm. and there will be a press coverage on all of this. The only way that we're really going to give these these stallion owners what they want is that they get the whole package, mm-hmm. and and we're going to give it to. It's going to cost us a little money this first time, but eventually I, I'm hoping we'll break even on this, and and we it'll, it'll get us on the minimum going. I gotcha. Very good, sir. Well, um, man, is there anything else you think ropers need to know about this? Is there anything we've we've missed? Any other questions that we well, haven't yeah, answered? A lot of questions. I think you've thought about <laughs> this a little bit. I, I think in, you know, but I, uh, um, I'm not anticipating any, any, uh, anything out of the ordinary. Uh, uh, of course, the big question out there now is the horses and they're, you know, I mean, finding those horses and we're going to keep on working on that and trying to point them in this direction and that direction. And, and hopefully now too, that the breeders are seeing that they really need to make an effort to promote their stay and they need to, they need to encourage these people that have offspring out of their stallion to get this mix. Yeah. Have you got yourself a Riata Buckle horse yet? <laughs> I tried. I, you know, I, I think the thing that I wanted to do, and it, it's really telling too, because 
you know, one of the reasons that I felt like we need more horses because the supply and demand for the curve is upside down, and a lot of these horses are priced pretty high. Mm -hmm. But I'm running into that right now because when I go out to look at them, they're they're asking the premium price on them, and I'm not opposed to giving the premium price for a horse, but. When I buy a horse, it's not going to be just for this event. It's going to be one that I want to ride all year long. It's going to be my backup horse. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not looking for buying a horse for this event. I'm looking to buy a riata that I can ride for the other 50 weekends out of the, out of the year. And that will fit that need. And I think that's what a lot of the rank and file cowboys are, are saying is, um, yeah, we want a Riata, but we're not going to give twice the going rate for this one event. We're yeah. going to take our time, and we may buy a three- or four-year-old and, and bring them up the right way, and we'll be ready for 2023 instead of 2022. So my answer is, no, I haven't found one yet, but I but I do plan on an open at some point. I will find, on the partner finder there, I'm going to find a guy with a Riata horse, and if he needs a partner, I'll take and go get in with him. But by next year, I'll have my own horses. Yeah. And uh, that, so, okay. So your answer to that question reminded me of a few other questions. Um, so first of all, it, can you, futurity eligibility, can you only compete on one horse at the Riata Buckle for one year? Or is it for, is it just five and under? Like, or do you only have one it's year? five and under. So if they're on a four-year-old, like, they'll be able to get in this year and next year. Okay, gotcha. I was a little confused about that when I was writing about the breakaway, which is also something that is coming down the pike. And then I guess last, the, the horse sale. We, we uh, You canceled the horse sale, it sounds like. Tell me about that. Well, we got a late start. It really did. Uh, um, uh, we were so scrambling so much trying to get the software built and get the com website up and everything and the advertisements out that the horse sale kind of lingered as one of the last things to come up. And we got such a late start on it, we didn't get very many horses in that to start with. And I think the general, and to it being the first year, I think that had a lot to do with it. a lot of the Riata horses had already been consigned within the big ranches and the big sales, um, within their own production sales. Mm -hmm. So they they had not made plans for putting Riata horses into this sale this year because it was so new. Now, once our event is solid, then I think they're going to gear their, and they see it, they're going to go, okay, I'm going to put X number in that sale next year. And, and of course, there's the big question that everybody's got is, you know, what should that sale look like? Um, horses that are broke, horses that are finished, two-year-olds, one-year-olds. I mean, I think there's a huge question on what the public is going to want from a Riata sale. And, and that discussion, we're going to get a lot of input on that. You know that when we're there in, in Oklahoma, we're going to, and, and after, we're going to have a lot of breeders telling us, here's what we want and here's what we think you should do. Mm -hmm. And we will react to those wishes. Yeah, it's always seemed to me, uh, as coming from some part of the family that raises horses, it it's always seemed like ropers don't really love to give a lot of money for babies and then raise them up like ropers would rather buy two-year-olds three-year-olds four-year-olds but the riata buckle as far as it's just going to change the game as far as people needing to have horses of certain it's, it's what however you want to pay for it if you want to pay for feed or for, if you'd rather pay for uh breeding or if you'd rather just pay in the sale for a four-year-old i suppose it's all i think it's, it's a matter of economics i mm -hmm. think those people that can afford to go buy finished horses will and those that can are going to do their own. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's, I think there's going to be, and, and it, 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 to me, the right sale is going to be one that covers all the spaces. Mm -hmm. it, it's going to be the one where someone can get instantaneous something, climb on a rope, just like a lot of horse sales, and can get these good quality horses bought young, cheap enough to where they can finish them themselves and they can play in the program. Well, perfect. It's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> We've been 
we've been talking about it for a long time now. So I, I'm very excited for it to happen. I, I have to say that I'm, I'm twice as excited right now as I was when you did the first podcast back in February, or whatever <laughs> it was, because it's it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. I did I didn't think I could get excited again about anything, but I'm having a lot of fun with this. I can tell. I can definitely tell. <laughs> well, thank you so much, sir. I appreciate your time today. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for asking. Of course. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.